So um, the, the title of my presentation today is Explore Nation. And, you know, my wife is American and she hates me uh, because this is utterly unpronounceable in English. Um, uh, and it's a word that I invented. Uh, and the goal for my presentation today is to try to convince you that this is something that is valuable. Uh, that exploration is something that we will be doing much more of in, in the future. It's all about the convergence of two different ways of looking at scientific data. Uh, one way is to explore and the other one is to explain. Uh, and from a technical point of view and also from a methodological point of view, there is a strong convergence between these two ways of performing visualization. Now, uh, what I will do first is to just to provide you with a little bit of a context uh, for where I'm, uh, I'm coming from. Uh, and Professor Bergen uh, was kind enough to, to mention the Visualization Center. Can we dim the lights just a, a little bit in here so that uh, the contrast is... Uh, being a visualization person, you, you care a lot about images. So, uh, so this is the center uh, in, uh, situated in Norrköping, a part of Lin Linköping University. Uh, but it's also a, a facility that we have been working on a lot to, uh, to produce an environment that combines different aspects uh, of the whole chain of going from very fundamental technical research all the way out to the application, working with the main experts using our tool, tools, but also working with the general public in terms of very young people coming to visit the center. Uh, so my office is up here, it's the smallest room in the whole building, uh, overlooking the Mutala River. Uh, but we also have production units that are taking research results and turning them into things that we can show to our visitors in the exhibits. Uh, we have a wonderful dome theater, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, we have a number of spin-off companies, we have more research over here, and we're very tightly integrated with the educational programs at the Linköping University. About 150 people in total working in, in the environment. So when you come visit us, you, don't only, you, don't, you not only see the, uh, the research uh, uh, environments, uh, you also uh, can visit our laboratories. Uh, so, uh, uh, so here is, for instance, one of the exhibit areas uh, where we are showcasing the use of visualization uh, in many different domains. Uh, everything ranging from astronomy to biology uh, and very, very interesting applications, but also showing interesting technology at the same time. Uh, and, of course, we have our dome theater, and I will talk about that in, in a little bit. Now, the whole essence of what I'm going to talk about today is perhaps captured uh, uh, in these underpinning trends uh, that are happening in society today. Uh, and it's four of them. I've added one today, actually. Now, now the first thing is that we have very rapid hardware development. Uh, and, you know, over, over the years, uh, the, the first visualization computer that I bought in 1997 uh, cost me about... Uh, uh, six million Swedish kroners. Uh, and the performance uh, of that machine is pretty close to what I have on my iWatch on my arm today. All right. So that's the kind of development that, that, we've, that we've had. Uh, the second thing is that we have new methods and software. Uh, a lot of development on efficient algorithms, uh, new software architectures, ways of dealing with data uh, that is becoming available. And <laughs> I'm sorry, this thing doesn't work that well for me. Um, the third thing is that we have access to very large and complex data. Uh, uh, and that access is very general. So uh, you can uh, um, uh, just download data from, from the net. We are generating it. We're making it publicly available. Uh, and this is a, a very new phenomenon uh, for us as well. And the third, uh, last item that I put in that we can really use, uh, and this is happening, that's where actually where I'm spending most of my research cycles right now, is to try to figure out how can I make use of artificial intelligence and machine learning methods to improve visualization in itself uh, and provide more high-level descriptions of data. So these four trends is, is really what I will be talking about. Um, now, there are a number of challenges that we need to deal with. Um, uh, and this is perhaps where, where this notion of the exploration comes into play. Now, um, uh, this means, these four trends means that I can take this domain expert over here in medicine. Uh, this is one of my friends, Anders Persson, who is a radiologist and a researcher in medical imaging. I can take the tools that I am developing for him and his team, and I can same this, take the same tools 
uh, and I can provide very interesting and engaging experiences for the general public using the same tools, the same data, the same methodology, uh, and just transfer that knowledge immediately out, out to the general public. Now, there are a couple of challenges involved in doing this. Um, and uh, one of the first challenges uh, is what we call the rendering, actually making the picture, the image, uh, representing the data. And, and one of the key things is that uh, when you deal with a domain expert, uh, they're pretty patient. Uh, they are un understanding in terms of glitches that you might have. But when you deal with children, especially teenagers, they're not. So we have people coming to our centers, uh, they start interacting with one of the installations, and they go up to it and they start moving things, and they say, oh, it's lagging. And you just want to walk up and hit them in the face and say, hey, kid, uh, this is actually 20 gigabytes of data that you're rotating. Uh, it's not a computer game. Uh, but that's a, something that we have to deal with. Uh, the other thing that we have to deal with is interaction. Uh, if you're in the public domain, if you're showing research things out in the public domain, you will have people that start interacting with your devices. And they start interacting, and if it doesn't work immediately, they interact a bit more. And if it still doesn't work, they start hitting on it until it breaks. So this is a problem. The last thing is the storytelling. Now, you have to be very efficient uh, and to maintain that notion of people being explorers themselves, to be the researcher uh, and guide them a little bit, because if they're just lost in the data, they're not going to learn anything from that. What we want them to is to find out things by themselves, but push them in the right direction. Uh, and this is the non-invasive storytelling approach that I will show you in, in just a little bit. Now, I'm going to show you a few examples of this, and, uh, and I know that some people in the audience have seen things before, but bear with me, towards the end there will be more and more new things that I guarantee that you haven't seen before. Okay? Now, uh, this is my primary example now. Uh, this is a, a medical CT scanner. Uh, it's an amazing machine. It's very high speed, uh, generally available at hospitals these days, but look at the scan speed down here. Uh, 737 millimeters per second. That means that just in a little bit more than two seconds, I can scan a full body. Uh, and when I scan, I have 25,000 slices of image data in about two seconds. The scan speed also means uh, that I can start doing time resolving scans, uh, and I can generate images while the patient is on the scanner. The, uh, the detector is 60 centimeters wide in this machine. That means that over 60 centimeters, I can start doing time resolved scanning with 20 images per second coming out of the machine. So I can do things like this. Uh, so here's a full body scan that I have obtained in two seconds, and I'm just putting everything back together again into a full, full body visualization. If I start doing time resolved scanning, it looks like this. Uh, so this is actually while the patient is in the scanner uh, and you ask the patient to move the joints and you can see how the foot is moving. Uh, and actually in this particular case over there. Okay, let's see. Now, how, how am I doing all this? Uh, <laughs> this is the, uh, the, uh, the challenge that we have. Now, imagine that I have these 25,000 slices of, of image data uh, that are coming through the body. Okay? Now, how am I turning those slices into something that looks like features on my screen because I do want to show objects. I, I want to take my 25,000 slices and turn them into something, <laughs> something that looks like, uh, like that. Um, uh, bear with me, I'm actually going to change this because it's double-clicking for me, so let me just change it. Now, so here we have uh, the 25,000 slices of data, and here's my block that I want to visualize. And you know, the process of producing the image is actually going from, from this representation over here into something that looks like this, uh, like the organ structure. And this is what we call the volume rendering, and it happens in, uh, in, a, uh, in a very nice way on the graphics processing unit. So, uh, let me just show you how that happens. Now, here we have the stack of data, 25,000 slices of image data. Over here is the human eye, and here I have the image plane on the computer. And what I do is actually shooting rays. Uh, for each of the pixels on the screen, I'm shooting a ray, a virtual ray, through the human eye uh, into the pixel screen, uh, and then sampling the data uh, in the volume. Uh, and then I do that very quickly, and I do it uh, several times per second for each of the directions on the screen. And then it looks like this. 
Now, the equation that I'm solving when I'm doing that uh, through each of the rays through the volume is this one. Uh, and I usually challenge my students, I'm saying, okay, this is a very easy equation, <laughs> and they should know this. They, these days they don't anymore, this is a shame. Uh, but if you take away this term, you realize that it's just an exponential solution. Uh, and I just had to put in an equation, an equation today so you can see this. Okay, so here's the, the very simple solution of, of that equation. And of course, we don't solve that uh, analytically, uh, but I sampled that equation uh, for each of the rays going through the whole data volume. Uh, and I do that very quickly. And when I do that, it looks like this on the GPU. So this is one of the reasons why I have very fast graphics processing units, and I carry one with me all the time. It's, uh, it's actually inside of this machine here. Now, so it's these two lines here. Uh, that's, that's all that's happening inside of the machine. And the reason why I'm showing you this, and it's kind of nice for me to be able to explain this, especially when I talk to younger people that, hey, look, there's a lot of math. There's these equations behind. Uh, I'm solving these equations, and I'm doing it very fast on a graphics processing unit. And thanks to the fact that I can program the graphics processing unit, and I can write what's called shaders, uh, I can do that very quickly. But it's very simple. It's just this expression down here that's collecting the color contributions, the opacity through the volume, and it's creating a color that I produce uh, on, on my screen. Uh, and this is one of those machines. It's actually very similar to the one that I have in my laptop here, uh, the NVIDIA GTX 980, which uh, incidentally is the same company that's now generating a lot of hardware for artificial intelligence and deep learning. Now, if I want to be even more sophisticated in this, uh, and I just wanted to bring up a, a few of the examples of what can happen when you bring the latest research to, to the public domain. Uh, what we're doing with these medical volumes is that we're also showering them with, uh, with virtual photons. Uh, so this light contribution over here is actually virtual photons that I'm just dropping millions of them into the volume, into the, volume the medical volume data. Uh, and I'm uh, calculating the path that the photon is taking, uh, and then I do some intelligent work on realizing which photons that need to be updated all the time, uh, and then I can actually do this on, on the GPU. And then it looks like this. Uh, so here is one of those photon-mapped medical uh, data. So this is just an X-ray image uh, that we have essentially put through uh, a virtual photon mapper. Uh, and uh, this is really state-of-the-art in terms of what we can do in, in medical imaging today. Now, if I take that to the functional domain, uh, then it looks like this. Uh, so here I use the, what we call the correlated photon mapping uh, to generate images coming out of the machines from various modalities. Here's ultrasound of a baby in 3D, here's functional MRI from a brain, and here's actually a beating heart uh, that we are visualizing in, in real time as well using the photon mapping, which is, which is uh, uh, really what we can do, the best thing we can do at this point now. Now, there's a, there's a lot of research behind many of these things that we have been working on, uh, and uh, I can just put up a, a few of the stamps um, that we've been working on here. So, and maybe that's also one of the key messages, that when you work in this domain with very fundamental technical research and you're pushing it out into the general public, you have to be very clear on saying, this is not only pretty pictures that you're looking at. Everything is based on mathematical principles, on a lot of engineering in terms of computers, in terms of software and programming work that's going on. Uh, but it looks very nice when you put it out on the screen. So stepping back a few years in time, what we did uh, with these methods that we developed was to put them on very large touch screens. Uh, and some of you may have heard of medical visualization tables. Uh, this is really the origin and the story behind the work that led up to the possibility to interact with very large data uh, on touch interfaces. So we took uh, our multi-resolution, what we call the volume rendering framework that I just explained a little bit about, some multi-touch technology, uh, we did some user interface design, uh, and all of a sudden we had a new uh, way of working with medical data, and this is the year 2009, I think just a year before that TED talk that um, uh, Magnus Bergen referred to. Uh, uh, so this is actually uh, a video that I used in that, in that talk uh, from 2009, how we could start interact with very large-scale medical data. But um, why show you a um, video when I actually uh, carry this very heavy laptop with me? So I'll see if I can, if I can actually show you how it works. So here we go. This is the scary part of my presentation when I switch from one source to another. We'll see if that works. Look, here we are. Now, uh, 
what I'm doing here now, now my screen here, you have to imagine that it's very big, <laughs> uh, and it's a table, but it's a touch, touch interface here. Um, uh, and I have a number of different cases, and I'll, I'll just show you one or two. Um, uh, let me bring up this one. This is actually from one of the largest scans that we did in 2009, which is uh, from a virtual autopsy. This is a woman, she died during very, very tragic circumstances, so it's always with the greatest respect for her and her family that I'm showing, showing these images. Uh, thank you for dimming a little bit. So, um, uh, so what I can do now is actually start interacting with the data in itself. Um, uh, and what's, what's really nice for me is to be able to, when I have young people around, I can say, look at the screen now, look at the pixels. Here, 60 times per second, I'm solving that equation. And thanks to the GPU, I can do that. It's all math and it's all computer science behind this. Uh, what I also can do is just tell the computer in that equation what's going to be transparent. Uh, and then I just I take off the layers like this. And uh, let's go for layer after layer. And, um, and let's zoom in down here. So here's actually what you can see. Here's the primary fracture. This is where the car hit uh, the woman. And, uh, and here we actually have an interactive virtual flashlight so I can calculate the light distribution and the volume in real time. And this is pretty hard, so you should be impressed by this. OK? <laughs> Very good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Now, um, so. When I move up a little bit further up, here you can see there are other fractures in the body, and, uh, and here you can also see uh, there's a fracture to the jaw up here. And, and this is, of course, the clue to the cause of death. So what I'm going to do is to cut a little bit in the data like this, there. And there you can see the cause of death, the broken neck. So this, of course, turned into a, a, a very hot topic in, in medicine and in forensic pathology, uh, doing virtual autopsies. That's a different story. Um, let me uh, bring up one more of the data sets and just show you the utility of this. Uh, let me do this one here. Uh, this is a perf perfectly healthy male. Uh, he's still alive. Uh, he's one of my friends. I, I'm not at liberty to tell you his name, uh, but some of you may recognize him. Uh, and uh, he put himself in the scanner, he said, I'm 60 years old, uh, a little bit of radiation uh, probably won't harm me. Uh, so uh, so we'll, we will bring him up in just a second. Here he is. Okay. There. So now you can see, here you can start talking about the process of doing CT scanning and uh, reconstruction. So over here you can see some reconstruction artifacts uh, on the body like this. Uh, the teeth uh, are absorbing so much x-rays that it's hard to find data to reconstruct. Uh, I can peel off the layers. I usually put them to the side, otherwise it's embarrassing. Um, yeah, you can, it's kind of embarrassing that way. Okay. So, uh, and, and I can show the skeleton. So, and the kids, they love this when I show them because uh, look down here, you can see, here you can see the zipper in the jeans and the buttons uh, here. You can look at the shoes and you can see steel in the shoes and everything like that. But one of the points that I can make here is also about medical scanning in general of healthy subjects is that this person uh, uh, was perfectly healthy, no symptoms, but has a very bad back. Look at the back, it's scoliosis. Uh, and there's a ruptured disc in there too, uh, but no symptoms. Uh, so this is one of the, one of the disadvantages. Now, now I have many, many, many data sets, so if anyone uh, uh, wants to play around with this after, after my talk, feel free to, to come up and we'll do that. So let me switch back. Now, of course, we got a lot of attention uh, based on this work, and, and I referred to my wife before. Uh, uh, she said, uh, she's a, a social scientist, and she said, nah, now you've finally done something that's okay, because they've written about you in The Economist. Uh, that's her measure of success. Nothing else counts. Um, but one of the, th the things that happened was that this turned into the medical visualization table, and to make a long story short, together with the company Sextra, it's been commercialized, and so far we have 600 tables in 30 countries, primarily used for medical teaching uh, of medical students, uh, but in some clinical cases as well for ortho or orthopedic surgery planning and things like that, which is kind of nice. That's not what I'm going to talk about. Uh, now, imagine that you have this research tool and you put it in the hands of, of, of other people, of laymen. Uh, so the Crown Princess came to visit us and she said, this is a very nice technology. Uh, 
bring it uh, to the World Expo in Shanghai because we need a better Swedish presence than, than what we have so far. So we did. Uh, uh, and the guys who went down there, uh, they called me uh, every day and said, we have thousands of Chinese people outside waiting to come in. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I was very impressed. Uh, I have since been to Shanghai and realized that a thousand people is not very much in China. <laughs> but um, uh, but uh, I was, at that point I was very impressed. But this was the beginning of realizing that maybe this technology can also make it out there in terms of other, uh, other applications, not only the experts. Uh, so we started working with, uh, with some museums, uh, the, uh, the Science Center in, in, uh, in Singapore, for instance, uh, we ended up with installations uh, over in, um, uh, in the US. Uh, so uh, here's the Fields Museum in, in Chicago where we are doing mummy, mummy work and things like that. Uh, and of course, here's the Museum of Technology and Science here in Stockholm. Uh, but the story really takes off into the next, next level of ex exploration uh, and explanation when we started working with the big museums. Uh, so here is the British Museum. And uh, the British Museum, they have a, a number of uh, artifacts, uh, subjects and objects uh, that they never show in, in, the, uh, in the galleries. Uh, but they have one mummy that they're particularly uh, proud of, and that's called the Gebelain Man. So the Gebelain Man is in Gallery 64 at the museum. Uh, so what we did was that we took the Gebelain Man, transported him to one of the hospitals in London and performed a CT scan of this mummy. Uh, he's from, uh, he's 5,500 years old, found in southern Egypt, close to the border to Sudan, and uh, they didn't really know how he died. Um, he was 19 years old, approximately. This is Daniel Antoine, my friend at the museum. Uh, he has an amazing title. He's the, the physical anthropologist head of human remains. So he's the mummy guy. Um, so. So um, uh, Daniel, he was very, very keen on, on finding out what happened to Gebelain Man. And this is the first exploration. This is a scientific exploration using the same tools as we use in the public domain. This is, these are scientists now exploring their data for the first time. Uh, so here's Neil Spencer. He's the keeper of Egyptology uh, at the British Museum. And here's some other people from the, from the British Museum staff. And they're trying to figure out what is this thing in the back. What is this fold in the back of the Gebelain Man? So, courtesy of the British Museum, I will show you the Gebelain Man. So, here we go. Uh, I have lots of other things too. I will skip those today. Here we go. There. Now, as I said, uh, 5,500 years ago, uh, uh, this is pre-dynastic, so, so this mummy was just, this person was left to dry in the sand, so he's not gone through any mummification process or anything. Now I can give you examples of you know, the, the, the non-invasive storytelling that I talked about. Uh, so here, for instance, I can talk about the different aspects. I can give you clues to what is the next thing that I should explore uh, to discover things about the Gebelain Man. Over here, I can start cutting. Here's a, here's a pair of scissors. So can, you can see that the brain is still there. It's, it's still intact. Uh, so it's, uh, and there's lots of uh, dried human tissue on the, on the inside as well. Okay. Um, but of course, the main question was, what is this thing over here? If I pick up the light source and show you this little fold back here on the left shoulder blade, what is that really? Uh, and this is the question that we were supposed to answer. So let's see if we can do that. Cut him open on the side, and here he goes, there. Okay, so right in there, well, let me bring this setting up instead. Right in here, you can see the rib cage is broken on the inside. Turns out that Gebelain man was stabbed in the back with a knife, a knife that went through the rib cage and punctured the lung, uh, and then he was left to die in, in the desert. So we even found the murder weapon. We found a knife that matches the wound. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we did not find the murderer. He's still free. But, um, but this, was, this was really big news for the museum. Finally, uh, after so many years, he's been at the museum for 100 years, and finally they, had, they could figure out what, what it was that really happened to him. So, uh, so of course, this uh, made the big news in, in the British Museum. They even talked about murder at the British Museum and things like that uh, in, in media. Uh, let's see if we can get the right thing here. There. There. No. Back again. Let's come in. There. 
All right. So one of the unique things that we can do then is to uh, perform amazing evaluations uh, when it comes to people in, the, uh, uh, in research on, uh, on computer graphics and visualization. If they have 10 users, they're very happy. Uh, just in a few months, we had more than a million users of, of, of the Gebelein Man. So, uh, so let me just show you a little bit about that. Because the museum was really afraid that this digital media would attract attention away from the physical artifacts that they had in the Gallery 64. So uh, we put them in, uh, in six months for a trial with a big table. And, um, uh, and we had one staff member who was, uh, who was watching us all the time. <laughs> uh, uh, there, okay. So the evaluation shows um, a, a number of interesting things. Is that the time that people spent in the gallery increased by 40% just because we had a digital installation in the museum, which is interesting. Um, uh, the uh, attention, uh, the people, uh, the fraction of visitors that stopped and looked at the physical display of the Gebelein Man increased from 59 to 83%. And uh, the ultimate number here is that the table was in use 95% of the time. And still today, uh, almost five years after the installation of the table, it's still utilized 95% of the opening hours. Someone is using it all the time. So we can easily say that the number of users we've had of this table is far beyond 10 million people at this point. And, of course, 60% uh, of the uh, users discovered the cause of death, which is the ultimate thing for a curator at a museum, for people to actually understand what has happened to their subjects. From a scientific point of view in computer science, the whole project in itself, the methodology behind the scanning, the visualization, turned into a very interesting article in the communications of the ACM, which is sort of the nature science in, in computer science. Uh, and we made the front cover in the December issue in 2016 with this story about the British Museum. Uh, and it's all, it's open access. And of course, if I put uh, the Gebelein Man uh, into the photon mapper, the latest uh, correlated photon mapper that we have today, he looks like this, uh, uh, with some beautiful, beautiful shading. Yes. Now I'm going to switch completely uh, to another domain. As I said, I will give you two examples of, uh, or at least two examples of, of this, this new way of looking at data. So I'm going to take a little bit of a, of a personal perspective. Uh, 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 I found this, uh, a picture uh, of this television set here. Um, and it's an identical television set to my grandmother's television set from 1969. It's the first color TV that we had. Uh, in 1969, um, uh, this happened. Uh, the, uh, the landing on the moon in 1969. I was six years old at that point. And I found this picture of myself. <laughs> so this is Christmas 1969. Uh, my mother is sitting in the back, and my brother got an ice hockey helmet, and I was, uh, got a space helmet. I refused to take it off for several weeks after getting this. And the only way I could eat was by opening up the visor, and they could feed me sandwiches in through, through the hole. I was going to space. That was my mission at that point. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't. Um, uh, Christy Fugesang got, got uh, uh, selected instead. Uh, but I got a chance to start working with space, which was a passion from, from my childhood, uh, with the help of the computers. Uh, so this is one of those big graphics machines from, from 1997. Uh, the Silicon Graphics Onyx 2 Infinite Reality Monster was this machine. Uh, and I am a few years younger at that point, uh, and I was very proud of that machine. That machine in itself uh, connected me uh, with a nice installation uh, of people um, in New York. Uh, so this is uh, the director of astrovisualization at the Hayden Planetarium in New York, and he had just produced a wonderful rendering of a fly-through of the Orion Nebula that I'm sure many of you have seen. Uh, I met him at a conference, the SIGGRAPH uh, 2001 conference, and I said, Carter, we should be doing this in real time. We should not be making movies. We should be flying through like a computer game through the, uh, through the nebula. We can do that now. And he said, no way, we can't be done. And I said, yes, we can. Uh, so we did. Uh, so I sent a number of my students over to New York to work at the Hayden Planetarium uh, uh, and uh, to start working on a piece of software that we called Uniview. Uh, and uh, Uniview has been shown in many, many different places all over the world. It's been uh, demoed in the, uh, to the White House, and here are the two students. We've had about 20 students working on it, and it's even turned into a commercial enterprise, a company called Skiss. 
but um, uh, this is uh, available, and I would just like to invite you all, because I cannot show it here. Uh, but for those of you who have not been to the Dome in, in, in Norrköping yet, uh, just give, send me an email and come and I will show you the universe uh, in, in the Dome. What I will do, however, uh, is to show you a little bit about the, uh, the work behind producing such a facility. Uh, so here is the, the Dome Theatre inside of the old power station in Norrköping, uh, and this is uh, from December uh, 2009. When we really felt the need to produce something uh, that would take the journey uh, using our software to fly out to the end of the universe inside of the Dome to tell stories about the evolution of stars, about the origin of the universe. Uh, but also take you back to Earth. Uh, and I'm going to try, this is a little bit of an experiment for me, I'm going to try to contextualize this for you. Now we're going to look at all the, the orders of magnitude in the universe and see if we can uh, contextualize those in a nice way. So, uh, so on a flat screen, uh, I wish we could be in the dome, but on a flat screen I will show you. Imagine now that you have been out there and you've seen the end of the universe. Uh, you've seen the cosmic background radiation, and you're coming back to planet Earth. And uh, we end up looking at this. And it happens to be one particular interesting place in the universe that we pick. And it's this one here. It just happens to be Sweden. Uh, and it just happens to be uh, the beautiful city of Norrköping, uh, next by Broviken, of course. So this is all rendered in real time, uh, and it's just captured. This video is captured from that screen. Now, as I'm getting closer, I'm kicking in models, and it's very seamless. There you can see I started kicking in models. These are aerial scans uh, uh, from a company called C3 Technologies that eventually turned into Apple's uh, uh, urban modeling uh, part. Uh, that's a different story. But we're zooming in over North Shipping, and we're finding our way through the Mutola River, and eventually we find one particular interesting place. Now, the whole idea is that you're sitting in this building here, and you're seeing this on a big dome around you. And the way that we can maintain context and emotional attachment to the content that you're seeing on the screen is by bringing you to the place where you are. So you're sitting uh, on one of these chairs and you're seeing this on the screen and then I pick a, a, a mug of coffee because that's also something tangible, something that you can perceive. You almost can touch the, the heat of the coffee mug. And the next thing we connect emotionally from coffee is, of course, the coffee beans that's coming into view here. And we're spiraling down logarithmically in scale. Now the coffee mug is as big as a building when a sesame seed comes into view. And then a salt crystal, which is sort of the last thing in scale that you can, uh, that you can have a tactile sensation of. Then comes an amoeba, then comes a paramecium, and then comes the symbol of human life itself, the egg and the sperm. And then we come a human cell, and the next one, how many knows how large is the blood cell compared to a normal human cell? And then comes the E. coli, and the bacteria phage come, and then the symbol that really threatens mankind, which is the HIV virus in itself. But you can still see the salt crystal over there. And here comes the rhinovirus, giving the common cold, and then you have the antibodies coming here, and then hemoglobin. And eventually, the biggest challenge of them all in this spiraling journey was to figure out how am I going to symbolize the atomic world uh, because I picked the DNA spiral and I didn't really want to show the Bohr orbitals. So here's the quantum noise that I'm in encountering instead. Picking one of the carbon atoms, going into the electron cloud and inside of the electron cloud I find the nucleus, orders of magnitude down and eventually the, the nucleus itself with six protons and six neutrons and inside of it quarks and then I'm at the 10 to the minus 18 and that's where I stop because that's the end of the observable universe. And at the same time I can see the cosmic background radiation, radiation on the screen. So all the orders of the universe in one single visualization. And I just wish that you could see this on the dome because the thing that you saw now was running three times faster than it does on the dome. If I would show you this visualization on the dome at this speed, you would all be throwing up because it's a very powering environment to be in. This is the fisheye rendering of that particular sequence. Um, sorry, it should start there. And look how slow it is. Now imagine that all of this is rotating around you and you were keeping the context. The coffee mug grows big like a skyscraper and at the same time you're spiraling down into the microcosmos.
This is the power of doing 360 visualization, and I'm happy that there are now head-mounted head devices, but they're not quite the same as being inside of a dome and experiencing this sort of cosmic journey in terms of sizes and scales. While we're down at, at this sort of level, uh, and now we're moving a little bit into the future, uh, visualization technology and, and this sort of the explanatory aspect of visualization has had a huge impact uh, in terms of showing animations of, uh, of the, the life of proteins and molecular machines. Uh, and we just recently launched into a collaboration with um, uh, one of the famous animators in, in, in this domain called Drew Berry. Uh, you have all seen his uh, animations out there. Here, here's the RNA transcription going on that he has been, uh, been doing. And, and then we have a very nice collaboration uh, with um, Ivan Viola from the Technical University of Vienna. Now, our goal is to bring these things alive uh, in a dome theater and do it fully interactively for people to communicate very complex phenomena inside of the cell. And uh, thanks to Ivan and uh, his team, I will actually show you how that could be. So let me see. Now. I don't want to turn my back on you, so I will do it this way. Here we go. There. Okay, so here we go. This is all rendered interactively, so it's just running on my, on my screen here. It looks nice up there too, yes. Uh, and here's HIV in blood plasma. Uh, it's data from the protein database, uh, and we're doing space filling uh, uh, with an algorithm called CellPack. And look at this. Thanks to advances in computer graphics, imposter rendering, GPU instantiation, all those things that we're doing, I can zoom in at the molecular level, like this. And I can do all of this fully interactively. Um, I can cut the, uh, the thing open, let's see, two cubes like that. And inside here you can see the RNA inside of the virus. <coughs> Uh, I can bring up this menu here, and let's turn off the blood plasma, and here's the virus itself. And in this way of explaining, I can click on individual proteins and read about them as well, which is kind of nice. This one you can also play around with if you want to. Let's see, where are we? So, while we're down in this domain, uh, now connecting to this again, we can also use the same methodology as to show these molecules we can use to provide interesting tools for learning. Uh, here's, for instance, a, a, a protein, uh, and I put a ligand on a haptic device, so here I can actually touch. I'm getting a sensation of force, uh, and I'm touching the protein, and I can feel the docking forces. Uh, so I'm generating uh, the positions, uh, and the person who is now interacting with this sees the protein in 3D. But you can also feel it with your hand, and you feel the forces. Now, trying this out on students, it turns out that the students start talking a lot about forces afterwards. They use the word force a lot more uh, than they did before trying out these systems. In the same way as I did this with the students, now I can do the full cycle and say, hey, researchers, can you use this in your research? And of course, yes, because now people start doing a very large molecular uh, dynamic simulations. Uh, and here are researchers at KTH and, and Karolinska who are interested in, uh, in Alzheimer's disease and the uh, amyloid proteins that are, that are generating uh, the plaques in the brain. Uh, and exactly the same methods I can start deploying and playing around with that and provide tools for them to explore their simulations and the statistics that are being generated in the simulations. 
So here's actually researchers themselves going the other way around, lending from the public domain visualizations that we are doing. I'm generating interesting tools for these people as well. Now, in my last five minutes, uh, I, I wanted to re return again to uh, my, my favorite topic. Uh, and, um, and if everything is, uh, is functioning for me, I will try to, to show you a few things as a, a grand finale here. We'll see. Now, Open Space is, uh, is a project that we have been running for uh, two years now. Uh, and again, it's the uh, American Museum of Natural History in London. Uh, together with the Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, the Visualization Center in North Shopping, the Ski Institute at the University of Utah and NYU uh, to conduct the next generation of visualization uh, uh, for space research, sp uh, space um, uh, communication. Uh, it's called uh, Open Space, uh, and the ambition is really threefold. Uh, visualization research, space astro research, and science communication. And the best way of showing you this is to give you an example of uh, what we can do. Uh, and I call this a little bit from what to how in terms of what I'm going to show you now. So uh, many of you remember uh, just a few years ago, uh, we had a mission that uh, was flying by Pluto called New Horizons. This is the, uh, the best picture uh, that was available of the dwarf planet Pluto before the flyby on the 14th of July in 2015. Now, after the flyby, uh, pictures of Pluto uh, look like this. So what I'm going to do now is to try to explain to you how did that happen? How could we go from this picture over here to this one? What kind of engineering efforts went into doing that? It's not only the science, it's not only the planetary scientists that are enabling this, it's also a lot of engineering behind it. So, now, uh, the New Horizons uh, spacecraft looks like this, this is before launch uh, in the assembly hall, uh, and uh, on the 14th of July, what we did was that we put together a number of different places and we try to do science live, to do science communication while the science is happening in itself. So here's, uh, here's the Applied Physics Laboratory at John Hopkins. This is where the engineers and the researchers are sitting themselves. Uh, and then we had 11 different sites that we connected in a real-time event to participate in the flyby. Uh, we even had a planetarium in a clay hut in Ghana down here. Uh, we had uh, Australia, we had all different time zones. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, North Shipping was, uh, was one of the sites where we were running much, much of the software. Um, so this is what it looked like. So this is the, uh, the dome theater in North Shipping. Here I have the live feed from, uh, from Mission Control. Here's a visualization of Pluto and the spacecraft. Um, uh, and here I am standing. I had a full, full audience, 100 people sitting in front of me, uh, participating in this very exciting, exciting event. Um, this is a little video from, uh, from the, uh, the moment of the flyby. So here's the, the video feed from APL, and I believe we might even have the sound of what it sounded like at 12,500 As we speak, these images are being taken. And you see the... Um, <laughs> and uh, this is incredibly exciting, i got to tell you. Wow. It's happening. <laughs> it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a, a, a several thousand people sharing that event uh, all over the world. Of course, we couldn't show any pictures because it takes a few hours to get images back from Pluto. Uh, but the engagement of all these people sitting there and having Neil deGrasse Tyson in New York uh, being the narrator and some other people. I, I usually say you all know Neil deGrasse Tyson and he talks a lot. Uh, this was the only time when I had a chance to interrupt him <laughs> and, and, and say now, he, now he's talking too much. Okay, now I will try to, to relive this moment in time for you. So, let's see, here we go. New Horizons, here. Now, it's, uh, the spacecraft itself was launched in, uh, in 2006. Uh, and uh, so now, I take you into space and we're four hours before the encounter. Uh, and now everything is running in in real time, and I'm sort of bringing things up for you here, okay? 
So you see Pluto, uh, we are focused on the Pluto center over there. Uh, the yellow line that you're seeing is the um, one hour in the trajectory of, uh, of the New Horizons spacecraft. So let me zoom in. Um, and we'll see if we can zoom in on the spacecraft itself. By the way, this, uh, all the stars in the background are in their accurate location, and not only in 2D, but in 3D. So if we want to fly out into the star field, we can do that too. Okay, so here comes the spacecraft, and uh, a nice model of it. Now, what I can start doing now is to start telling the stories. I can start telling the stories about the spacecraft itself. Uh, and all the instruments that we have on the spacecraft. So you can see there is one camera down here at the bottom called the lorry camera. This is the long range reconnaissance imager. This is the camera that took all those pictures that you see in the newspapers. Here we have star trackers that are used to orient the spacecraft. Here is the ultraviolet spectrometer up here. And uh, here is the, uh, the infrared instrument sitting over here. Here's a dust collector. Uh, here's a solar wind experiment. and. Uh, and of course, on the other side, we have uh, the fascinating uh, power source, which is 12, 12 kilograms of plutonium sitting over here uh, with a thermonuclear reactor generating 300 watts of power, uh, generating enough power to have a risk processor that's uh, doing all the image processing. And of course, a radio antenna with very bad bandwidth back to planet Earth. Okay, now let's see what happens over here. So here's the spacecraft, and over there is Pluto. Now, what you're seeing down here is the view frustrum of the camera. I'm gonna play back time a little bit faster for you. And you can see how the spacecraft starts moving. And the view frustrum will move as well. Okay, now here we go. Now it's taking pictures of Pluto. Look, it goes click, 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 click. That's how that science was made. Let me zoom in on Pluto for you. And see how those imaging campaigns happened. Okay, now the camera moved over to, uh, to Caron instead. But this is the imaging mosaic that was built up by New Horizons. This is how that science was done. And imagine the engineering efforts that went into programming the spacecraft to do all these complicated maneuvers, all these instruments to take the images, down to the millisecond and doing that 10 years before it happens. Uh, and you have a chance to do very few updates. Look, here's an imaging campaign coming in. Click, 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 click. And as we're flying closer and closer, the nearest flyby was 12,500 kilometers away. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, the best images that we get. Now, zooming out again, uh, we can follow the spacecraft on its trajectory. And you can see how they carefully engineered the, uh, the trajectory. Now we're getting very close to the, the actual uh, flyby itself. And I'm going to play time even a little bit faster for you. Here we go. There, now we're flying by. So here is the actual flyby. This is when you had all, all the laughters and the applause uh, from the audience over there before. Uh, we're coming in and, and we're f carefully flying through the shadow behind Pluto so that we can use the sun as a light source to illuminate the very thin atmosphere uh, and analyze that with the instruments on board. And there you can see the sun and now we're going to fly into the shadow over here. There we go. And that's how we figured out that Pluto has a very thin atmosphere. So Science Live uh, is uh, one of the key things uh, about this project. Um, and in the sake of saving some time, I will bring up another one here for you. This is brand new, so, uh, uh, so bear with me if, it, if the demo effect is a little bit with me. Let's see. Now, th this one requires access to the um, uh, to, uh, to the networking, so we'll see if that works for me. Now, in the same way as we were flying by uh, Pluto, uh, uh, instruments have been flying by other, uh, uh, other planets. Um, so let's see, I'm gonna switch focus to Mars. Now, here we go. For many, many years, there's been spacecrafts orbiting around the planet and taking beautiful pictures. And, um, Let's see, uh, R, there, okay. So what you're seeing now is actually the Viking mosaic from the Viking missions from the 1980s that you're looking at Mars now. Uh, let me zoom out a little bit again. 
I'm going to rotate the planet by playing time around a little bit for us. Okay, now trust me, this is very scary to do. Let's see. <laughs> okay, here we go. There. Because I'm looking at, uh, see if I can find one particular spot on the planet that I like a lot. Let's see, here it comes. Okay, now, uh, if you ever go to Mars as a tourist, I recommend going to the Valles Marineris, which is coming up right here. Uh, this is an exciting place on Mars. And let's see if we can start zooming in. Here we go. Okay. Now, this is the kind of resolution that we had for many years, but thanks to the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that's been orbiting around, um, we have much better resolution. Uh, and um, let me show you how we can zoom in on this thing here. Now bear with me in the little jerkiness here. Okay, so we're zooming in. And what I'm going to do now is to enable uh, textures, images with about six meter resolution uh, over the um, uh, over the uh, the whole surface. And now this is being read over the net as we're looking at it. So nothing is is here. So now we have six meter resolution over Mars, and in one particular little spot where we have uh, managed to do a lot of data processing we have generated uh, resolutions down to 25 centimeters. So here we're zooming in, okay? And at this point, uh, I'm going to tilt the camera for you. Let's see if we can do that. Like this. So you can see that we have 3D terrain information here too. And we're going down, here we go. So this is all real data, nothing is simulated, everything is just captured data from, here we go, let me see if I can rotate around a little bit, tilt the camera a bit more. Here we go. So I say welcome to Mars, on the surface of Mars, here we go, there. I'll bring you down a little bit more. So the formations that you see here, uh, they're uh, the size of a regular uh, building at this point. And if, there, if we had cars and human beings down here, you would be able to see them. What you're seeing now is completely unique. No human being has ever seen what you're seeing now before because it's all generated on the fly based on the data that we have. This place is called Western Kandokasma, and uh, as we speak, we're processing more and more and more of data over Mars, like this. So this is, to me, maybe the essence of exploration, is to explore this data and to explain it at the same time. And, you know, if you, if you don't want to fly to Mars, uh, uh, this is the best way. And, and, I'm and experiencing this in the dome in Norshipping, being completely immersed uh, and someone knowledgeable talking about Mars is a wonderful experience. Okay, great. I say thank you to the computer for doing this for me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, now I'm just going to wrap up for a minute. Okay, here we go. So, uh, and of course, the latest thing is that we also added the atmosphere. And we're very happy to have received the best paper award at the most prestigious visualization conference for this work on exploring the surface of Mars, which is nice. So it's science, it's hardcore computer science at the same time as we're doing this wonderful exploration and explanation uh, to the general audience. If you're a space physicist and you want to look at space weather, uh, we can do that too in the same software. Uh, and uh, wonderful images and scientifically uh, interesting results. The space weather simulations, look at CMEs, corona mass ejections, space weather, uh, those big simulations that we previously could not visualize at all. Now we can do that in real time. So I hope that I've convinced you uh, over this past hour that actually bridging the gap between very fundamental technical research uh, some interesting research in the domain that we're working with, uh, the tools where we, that we are applying over here, and also doing public engagement at the same time, generates a lot of added value for everyone involved. Now, uh, this is the idea behind, and some of you may have heard, of the uh, big donation uh, that we received from the Wallenberg Foundation, 150 million Swedish kroners, uh, to develop similar installations. Some of the things that I've shown you 
to not only show it to the people that end up in the rural place of Norrköping, but also on, on the biggest scale in Sweden. So these sites over here will all be combined together into a joint effort that we call the Wisdom Project, uh, where similar things to what you've seen, not only in the dome, but also interesting installations, storytelling about science will happen at the University of in Gothenburg, the Tekniska Museum over here, uh, Malmö Museum and the Umeå Torget up in Umeå. And we also have some interesting international partners in this endeavor uh, that's going to last for uh, eight years. Now, my final picture is this one. Um, and it's, uh, it's this nice picture. It's not the actual kid, but it's symbolizing the kind of visitors that I have on a daily basis. You know, being a, a research professor in, uh, in visualization and computer science and having these kids come to my lab on a daily basis is kind of challenging and interesting at the same time. So one day, uh, one Saturday, they called me from the center and they said, hey, we have 50 astronomers coming today. Uh, and they all expect to see something wonderful and they want to go to specific galaxies. Uh, so I show up uh, and I say, well, at least I'm knowledgeable in, in this domain. Uh, and then they had sold tickets to families with kids at the same time. So I had all these experts in the room and I had kids, six-year-old kids. Uh, so my presentation became a presentation of uh, planets because I thought the kids, they like planets. They love planets, okay? Uh, they understand that. And then a lot of galaxies because the astronomers wanted the galaxies. Uh, and uh, then afterwards I felt very guilty. So I walked up to one of the, one of the kids and I said, hey, I'm really sorry that I spent so much time. It was probably very boring for you to listen to the stuff about the galaxies. But you liked the planets, didn't you? And then he looked at me with big eyes and he said, in, in a Norshipping accent, he said, well, I know about planets, but galaxies, that was cool. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, they understand much, much more than you think. And the visual media is really carrying across those boundaries from one uh, domain to another, one category of people across l uh, lingual, cultural, age borders, whatever you have. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a great place to be and a great place to work. What you've seen is not only my work, it's a lot of people. Uh, and here are just a few of the names of the people that have contributed to everything that we do at the center. And I'm very proud of being their representative and talking about their stuff. And I'm very grateful for you to listening to me for almost an hour. Thank you.